see those slides. There we go. Is everything looking good on your end? We can see it, yes. Okay, great. So I'm here to chat with you all tonight about the My Birds or Michigan Birds program uh, and how we're working to gain broad-based public support for bird conservation across the state of Michigan. I'm also going to highlight a few key conservation projects that we're working on and opportunities for you all to get involved in some capacity. Uh, so as Landon mentioned, my name is Erin Rowan and I am the Senior Conservation Associate with Audubon Great Lakes and Michigan DNR. It's a unique joint position uh, and I've been with the program now since 2018. I previously worked with Detroit Audubon as their research coordinator and before moving to Michigan, uh, lived out in California and worked at the Institute for Bird Populations where I helped coordinate their bird banding program called MAPS or Monitoring Avian Survivorship or Productivity and Survivorship. I'm really happy to call Michigan home now. I've been here about six years and I really enjoy it. You all have really amazing birds. I know at West there's some good ones you can't see here, but the number of warblers you have rivals <laughs> at West for sure. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the My Birds program, it is an outreach and engagement program founded by Audubon Great Lakes and Michigan DNR back in 2016. And the main goal is to increase all Michiganders engagement in the understanding care and stewardship of public lands that are important for birds and people. Uh, I, real quick, Erin, I'm sorry. The, we're getting where there is the mic is kind of jumping in and out again again oh, okay yeah. is this a little bit better i might no, have to hold it by my face yeah sorry about that no worries sorry on on my end um so uh, we do have a steering committee as well of about a dozen conservation partners, uh, and it's a diverse group of folks. We have Ducks Unlimited, Pheasants Forever, uh, National Wild Turkey Federation, along with uh, Detroit Audubon, who I mentioned, uh, American Bird Conservancy, and others like Detroit Zoo, Kalamazoo Nature Center, uh, and the Nature Conservancy Michigan, among a few more. Um, all of these folks contribute to our overall messaging and content, as well as co-hosting some of our events. Um, and we try to pool our resources as well to help with monitoring needs of other partners and, and their projects as well for bird monitoring. So we have four main messages and I, I wanted to share these because this is kind of what the My Birds program is all about. Um, we highlight how Michigan is such a special place. Like I mentioned, you have such great avian diversity here. Uh, you're in the unique Great Lakes ecosystem. You're also at the intersection of two migratory flyways, the Mississippi and the Atlantic. And it brings over 400 bird species through the state each year. Um, we also want to highlight how restoring lands for birds is also beneficial for people, not only for our own health as far as clean water and air, but also our own community resilience with climate change moving forward. We also want to highlight that it's up to the rest of us to care for our natural areas and kind of instill that sense of stewardship in Michiganders across the state, um, as well as highlight how historically hunters have really spearheaded state lands conservation in Michigan uh, for the DNR's wildlife division. So we're home to over 100 state wildlife and game areas, many of which double as important bird areas. And those have historically been uh, funded by hunter monies um, through DNR's wildlife division. But with hunting on the decline, that means there are fewer resources available to manage those areas. Um, successfully and restore those areas. Um, so there is a, an, an increasing need to help our public lands uh, for our, our birds and our own communities. So the main objectives of the program are to increase public awareness of birds and threats to birds in Michigan, educate the public on the benefits of healthy natural spaces, and recruit and train volunteers to participate in stewardship and bird monitoring efforts. Um, on our public lands and um, primarily our important bird areas. So it is an outreach and engagement program first and foremost. Uh, you can find us online. We have a strong social media presence now on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. 
Twitter. We also launched a website and blog series uh, about a year and a half ago now. Um, and we post blogs bi-monthly uh, on various bird conservation topics, including highlighting these opportunities for folks to get involved in stewardship and community science. We also email uh, Audubon members across the state and DNR email subscribers through their statewide digest, as well as their wildlife viewers uh, email list. And then we communicate with the press often as well on current uh, bird conservation topics. Before COVID, we led immersive field trips across the state on public lands, typically 12 to 20 a year. I'm really missing those. Uh, we have now switched to webinars um, where we are reaching more people, which is great uh, because yeah, we're able to, to reach folks across the state instead of just within maybe a 40 mile radius of our, our events. We're also still recruiting volunteers for stewardship and community science opportunities because luckily most of those efforts allow folks to stay socially distant um, and safe during the COVID crisis. And just a, a little bit of background too on our program reach. We, prior to COVID, we're reaching roughly a thousand Michiganders each year with our in-person events. Uh, we also had field trips that were co-hosted by our partners as well as other outside uh, conservation organizations. And we've successfully recruited over 300 volunteers each year for various community science and stewardship projects. Uh, our Great Lakes team is constantly impressed by Michigan audiences. You are all extremely engaged and I have been so uh, thrilled with how birders really want to get involved and participate. So I, I just love, I love being here. I feel very at home in Michigan and really, really love the birding community here. Uh, so I did mention some stewardship. We co-host events with partners, like I mentioned, including Michigan United Conservation Clubs. And one of our goals with the My Birds program is to help kind of bridge the gap between hunters and birders. So co-hosting events with these folks helps bring hunters and birders into the same room uh, for stewardship. And this was a wood duck building, uh, or wood duck nest building uh, workshop for these nest boxes. And then we also do installations at different state game areas. We also uh, work with our steering committee partners and also elevate their stewardship events. So you can find information about our partner stewardship events as well on the MyBirds page. So it's really great kind of one-stop shop um, to see what's near you. This is a Detroit Audubon project we helped with uh, 2019 with a cleanup in the spring in preparation of a meadow installation at an underutilized city park in Detroit. Uh, they're working on their Detroit Bird City project, expanding that to five different city parks. And now I wanted to kind of take a step back from our program and think about the bigger picture and why this work is so important, uh, looking at the state of our birds. So back in the fall of 2019, I'm sure a lot of you saw the study that came out, the 3 billion birds gone report that showed we've lost nearly 3 billion adult breeding birds across North America since 1970. The most shocking thing was that this showed that the overall decline covered a wide range of species and habitats. And that has major implications for overall ecosystem health because birds are a great indicator of habitat quality. We are also surprised to see that some of our most common species have shown the largest declines. That includes some of our favorite backyard birds like blue jays, Baltimore orioles, white-throated sparrows, our harbingers of winter, the dark-head junco, and rose-breasted about a month later, Audubon's latest survival by degrees report was published, which showed that two thirds of North American species are at risk of extinction due to climate change. So the main two takeaways, apart from the number of species at risk of extinction, uh, is also that the science shows that if we're able to take action now and help reduce that climate warming to just one and a half degrees Celsius, as opposed to three degrees Celsius, we can actually help improve the chances for 76% of those species at risk. 
And here in Michigan, uh, that is 55 species um, that are at risk of climate uh, extinction. But what also came from uh, these studies is a reason for hope. There were some silver linings, uh, as the Audubon report mentioned, if we're able to keep warming at a certain level, we're able to help most of those birds that are at risk. Um, and I just love Jane Goodall. She's constantly trying to invigorate hope in folks and action um, and reminding us that what we do really makes a difference. So the Three Billion Birds Gone report had some silver linings and showing us what species have bounced back from the brink of extinction thanks to conservation efforts and partners working together. Um, here in Michigan, we've seen raptors bounce back as well. Um, we've really benefited from these conservation efforts in the Great Lakes region. So we saw 15 million breeding adults return to the population thanks to the banning of DDT and increased environmental protections. We also saw a big increase in woodpeckers, and this is primarily due to improved land management practices. Here in Michigan, when we first colonized the state, we overlogged and overharvested our forests, and several of our woodpeckers were nearly extirpated from the state, some of which were only seen in the UP. And then we went on the opposite end of the spectrum, letting our forests regrow and not wanting to do any disturbance, um, which wasn't really great for the birds either. We've learned over time that we need to have these natural disturbances, prescribed burns, um, some tree removal as well as making sure we retain snags in order to have a mosaic of forest ages and understories that can really support a great diversity of birds. So there's some thought also that this woodpecker increase is also due to emerald ash borer, which is also not a great thing. It's an invasive species that's really wiped out a lot of our uh, ash trees, but it did potentially create food sources and habitat for some of these woodpeckers as well. And the uh, pileated is one of my favorite examples here in Michigan that was previously nearly extirpated from the state but is now seen as far south as Detroit. It has adapted to living in smaller woodlands and is now a frequent backyard bird visitor for some lucky folks as well across the state. And waterfowl we've seen has had the biggest gain since 1970 of 35 million breeding birds. And again, thanks to concerted conservation efforts, state and federal agencies working together, um, primarily with duck hunters that have really been the leaders in wetlands conservation over the last hundred or so years. And what can we do to help? So these are some really big issues. What can we do to help kind of localize it and, and contribute to helping our feathered friends? So in Michigan, um, one of our, our first steps is to set aside and protect habitat. Like I previously mentioned, Michigan is home to 103 important bird areas. Some of these are globally recognized, some are state recognized. Uh, for their importance for migratory birds. And these areas support either different species that are sensitive, a great number of species during migration or the breeding season, uh, or species that are limited or constrained to a particular habitat type that is more rare these days. Um, you can learn more about each of these Michigan important bird areas by visiting Audubon's uh, important bird area page. And there, the full uh, list is there. You can click on a report as well to see which species have been observed and why that area is listed as an important bird area. So making sure that these areas remain protected moving forward is extremely important. Step two is to manage this habitat. So Audubon doesn't have any dedicated funding for important, area, important bird areas, um, but over half of our important bird areas in Michigan are owned and managed by Michigan DNR. And step three is to attract birds. So if your habitat management isn't doing the trick, you can also use lures. Uh, this is an example from some of Audubon's colonial water bird conservation work across the Atlantic coast and, and in some of the Great Lakes as well. We've got some common terns here. 
And then step four is managing threats as needed. So keeping an eye on invasive species that might be moving into an area, degrading habitat like the Phragmites pictured here, um, or taking additional management uh, actions. So this photo here with this PVC is a nest platform that we've had to install um, for breeding black terns across Michigan due to these higher water level years made the nesting substrate that they use a little more unstable and uh, not as dense. So these have, have been put in place too in an effort to help them in, increase their hatching success during these high water level years. And the final step where you all can really play a big role is monitor, monitor, monitor. Uh, really important to monitor at these important bird areas, like I mentioned, Audubon doesn't have dedicated funding for, for IBAs across the board. Uh, we're able to do some site-by-site -site monitoring and restoration um, at some individual IBAs, but it really helps when folks go out and either submit observations via eBird um, or participate in some of these site-by-site -site projects. And based on Audubon's colonial water bird work uh, from all of the work we've done for common terns and Atlantic puffins, we're seeing that birds do respond to these restoration efforts. And a new study uh, that was recently published also showed that this conservation work is most successful when there are volunteer stewards involved in these projects. Uh, conservation projects that don't have those local champions, those local stewards are not as successful. So you all really are important um, in this bird conservation work. So I'm going to take a moment to highlight some of the community science projects near you uh, and how you can get involved. So I mentioned the osprey has seen a great comeback in Michigan, and uh, one of the projects my birds assisted with was the Adopt a Nest Osprey Monitoring Program. And the osprey conservation status across the state was formerly state threatened, uh, but thanks to the hard work of several of our partners like Detroit Zoo, uh, Michigan DNR, and then friends at Huron Clinton Metro Park Authority and Osprey Watch, which is a citizen science. Uh, they were successfully reintroduced to Southern Michigan. We went from having just about 50 nests in the state back in 1965 to now over 200. Um, so these birds are doing extremely well and their status has been upgraded to a species of special conservation concern. Uh, and that happened in 2009, a full 10 years ahead of schedule. So Michigan DNR and Osprey Watch had primarily been observing osprey nests in Southeast Michigan, and they wanted to expand that effort and open it up to volunteers because they were getting a very limited picture of how well osprey were doing in the state. So we launched the Adopt a Nest program uh, last year and recruited over 300 volunteers across the state, across 35 counties. And over 120 of those volunteers successfully monitored over 200 nests, which is great. Uh, dozens of these nests were also new records for Michigan DNR uh, that weren't previously on their list of known nesting sites. So again, having those community scientists and those stewards uh, really helped fill a knowledge gap. We're waiting to hear back from Michigan DNR on their needs for this year for volunteers, but we will be putting updates out on the MyBirds page and out via email uh, next month. So keep your eyes and ears peeled for those announcements. I know we will need some volunteers, I just don't know which counties yet. <laughs> And then we're also helping with secretive marsh bird surveys at a few sites across the state. And I wanted to give you a little background on, on marsh birds and why they're important. So we had mentioned that waterfowl have seen a big comeback um, and that waterfowl hunters have really uh, helped lead wetlands conservation uh, for the last several decades. But we're seeing that while 
those efforts have been beneficial for waterfowl, secretive marsh birds are still kind of being left behind. They're, they're in steep decline. They're still not getting uh, what they need out of that. Um, so we're trying to do what we can to understand the causes of these declines um, outside of, of wetlands loss, which is certainly a factor. Uh, Michigan has lost over half of its wetlands. Um, but we're also looking at things like habitat uh, degradation. I mentioned invasive species can really play a role and secretive marsh birds are, are very sensitive to environmental changes. So they're great barometers again for environmental quality. They're also uh, vulnerable to invasive species invasions, their habitat type, and they're difficult to study and detect because they're secretive. Um, they are not very vocal or active outside of the half hour or so before and after sunrise. Um, and it, they are usually something that is difficult to detect uh, without audio playback. Um, and that's not something, you know, you really manage to do during say breeding bird surveys or breeding bird atlas work. And these emergent marshes that they live in aren't really covered very well during some of those surveys too. So it's a, a group of birds that is often overlooked in some of these larger data sets. So using a specific protocol that's made just for secretive marsh birds, uh, these surveys can really help estimate their population trends, um, but also inform land managers and assess the success of our conservation actions. So it's something, these are a group of birds we like to monitor in conjunction with habitat restoration or enhancement in wetlands because they do seem to respond uh, really quickly. So here are some of the, the population trends from the Great Lakes uh, monitoring program. You can see all these pink lines signify a significantly declining trend. So we've got the black tern, uh, the common gallinule, which has the common moorhen coat up there, uh, sora, and then the pied bill breeds seeing some steep declines. American bittern is stabilizing. Uh, Virginia rail is still in steep decline across the Great Lakes. Least bittern has started to see some population increases. And it's possible this is due to some of the deeper water we've been experiencing. Um, even though these birds are smaller than their American bittern counterparts, they do hunt in deeper waters uh, above the water surface as pictured here. Their long toes grasping on the cattail or emergent vegetation. Um, and then swamp sparrows as well seem to be stabilizing. So these focal species, uh, along with a few others, were put into a spatial prioritization analysis that Audubon did to identify high priority wetlands for conservation um, that would most benefit these birds that are in most conservation need. So we looked at a lot of different variables as well, looking at eBird observations, invasive species, uh, suitability, focal bird species predicted phosphorus and nitrogen levels uh, to identify what these wetlands, uh, or which wetlands, excuse me, are, are the most important. So these are the 12 priority areas that came out of that study. And this is kind of going to be the guiding framework for a lot of the on the ground work we'll be doing here. And five of these 12 areas fall in Michigan. So Eastern Lake Michigan, close to where you are all at, uh, is, oops, sorry, uh, I'm, I'm blocking some of my own information here, <laughs> but this is uh, an area that covers most of Lake Michigan. Uh, but as you can see, there are certain wetlands that go inland as well along the river mouths um, from the Kalamazoo River to the White River. And this area includes over 40,000 acres of high priority wetlands. And it's an area with some larger cities nearby as well. So we have over 1200 Audubon members in the area that can engage with these spaces. And a few years ago now, we started working with Ottawa County Parks and Recreation uh, to collect some baseline marsh bird monitoring. 
numbers across the Grand River. So this includes areas like Stearns Bayou, uh, the SAG, which is part of Ottawa Sands County Park, um, as well as uh, Stearns Bayou County Park. And we're hoping uh, to assess restoration potential of some of these areas, uh, as well as getting these baseline marsh bird numbers, and then also doing some habitat enhancement, like removing invasive species from Stearns Creek. There is potential for expansion of these monitoring efforts, um, and we are hoping to also engage residents, uh, not just in the monitoring efforts, but in advocating for some of their regional planning as well. So this year, uh, there is a potential opening at two of our survey locations out in the Grand Haven area. Um, so I know you all are nearby. If this is something that you're interested in, please reach out to me. Uh, my email address will be at the end of this presentation. Um, we also, like I mentioned, have opportunities for expansion. So even if you can't participate this year, there is a likelihood that you'd be able to participate in future years. Another one of our priority areas in Michigan is Saginaw Bay, which is home to over 68,000 acres of priority wetlands. It is the largest watershed in the state, and we only have about 250 Audubon members there because there aren't a lot of large urban areas there. Uh, we are also doing some marsh bird monitoring here, as well as some black tern monitoring at Wigwam Bay statewide. Uh, this wildlife area also doubles as an important bird area. So since this is a, an area where we're doing some dedicated black tern monitoring, I'll dive into black terns a little deeper. Um, their population decline has been ongoing since the 60s across the region, and they're a poorly understood species um, for all the reasons we were talking about with secretive marsh birds. Um, they're very difficult to study um, and very for that reason, difficult to understand the reasons behind these population declines. So at Wigwam Bay, we do some nest monitoring. We go out and track the number of nests and determine the hatching success of those nests. Additionally, we band and capture adult black terns and chicks. We use stainless steel bands from USGS and some color bands. You can barely see the color bands on these guys, um, but the adults are given yellow color bands with numbers on them and you can barely see the neon green uh, band on the chick's leg there. But we are hoping that with the long-term effort of mark recapture studies, we can learn a little bit more about their survivorship and create an integrated population model for the species in the region. It's not something that's been done before for this species, and it's something that will help give us a better idea as to what point in their life cycle uh, is causing that population decline. So are there enough adults that are surviving year to year or are not enough of their young uh, surviving and successfully returning as adults to breed? Um, their young also require two years at sea on their wintering grounds before they reach maturity to return to the Great Lakes to breed. So as far as recapturing or reciting these color bands, we have to be patient for those chicks to come back. With that said, uh, there is some site fidelity with these adult black terns. We know that some return to the same breeding grounds. But our partners in Canada did show on one of their geolocated birds that it did switch to a different breeding site one year and then return to its original breeding site again the following year. So they could move. So there is a likelihood, even though we're only color banding these birds in southeast Michigan, that you might spot them out in southwest Michigan. Um, so if any of you are birding and happen to see a color banded black tern, please let us know and you can also submit those observations to the bird banding lab. Even if you can't see the number also, I know that would be difficult to see with binoculars without a telephoto lens. Um, you can let us know the color that would still give us some good information as to where the bird was banded and its original age at banding. 
So I mentioned too that a lot of the monitoring we're doing is in conjunction with some habitat work. So at Wigwam, um, we are looking at enhancing the habitat within this diked wetland unit. As you can see, there are some pockets of open water, but most of that tan color there is cattail, dense stands of cattail, a narrow leaf and hybrid cattail. And it's it's not great for secretive marsh birds. It's not great for waterfowl when it gets this dense. Um, so one of the things we're hoping to do is to cut openings uh, within these dense stands and doing that a few different ways um, between 2018 and 2020. And we've got some scheduled kind of maintenance uh, for 2021 and then continuing to monitor the birds through, through that period of time and see if they move into some of these newly opened areas to nest or not. So we're hoping that we'll see birds respond and move into these new areas, but this is work that will help direct land management for Michigan DNR moving forward in a way that benefits black terns as well as secretive marsh birds and waterfowl. Another one of our priority areas here in southeast Michigan, where I am, is uh, the Detroit River and St. Clair Flat State Wildlife Area, which also doubles as another important bird area. This uh, region and the Detroit River section does go farther south than what's shown here, uh, covers 70,000 acres of high priority wetlands and we're also doing black turn and secretive marsh bird monitoring in this area. And because it's a really urban area, we have over 8,300 Audubon members here uh, that we can engage in this work. We're also adding a wetlands restoration and enhancement component to the black turn monitoring this year. We're really excited about that. We got the grant awarded two years ago, but due to COVID had to postpone our, our work last year. So similar to Wigwam, we do adult banding here at St. Clair Flats. We've been monitoring the population at St. Clair Flats of Black Tern since 2013 in conjunction with Detroit Audubon, as well as Michigan DNR, Canadian Wildlife Service, Detroit Zoo, a Common Coast Research and Conservation, and Indiana University, as well as University of Michigan. So a lot of partners are really needed to achieve this work and to uh, get a lot of work done. Uh, addition, uh, additionally, excuse me, to the adult banding and trapping, we also switch to banding chicks as well. And this is an area because we have so many years of data at this site, um, this is also going into that integrated population model that I mentioned that we're hoping will tell us a little bit more as to what is causing the decline or what part of the life cycle um, of the black turn they're seeing this pressure in that's causing the decline. And one of the areas that we're learning is very difficult to measure is fledging success. So we can track eggs until they hatch, but once these chicks are a few days old, they blend in so well with their surroundings and they're able to swim away from the nest and hide in lily pads. And they're very difficult to, to track until they fledge. So we started a new project where we're using MODIS technology, which is a radio telemetry technology. Uh, MODIS stands for movement or stands for, it means movement in Latin. <laughs> um, it is not an acronym. And this is a network that was created up in Canada originally, but is now expanded across the globe. So we have radio receiver towers, which are represented on this map by all of these yellow dots. And more are getting uh, set up across the Great Lakes region. Uh, for this Black Turn project, uh, Audubon Great Lakes established some additional towers around Lake St. Clair, uh, where that little red diamond is. These were our expected tower locations. And this map shows we've got three of them. We just installed our fourth one here at Lake St. Clair. Uh, the southernmost one was installed by Detroit Zoo. And we're hoping to get another tower installed at Wigwam Bay uh, this year because we'll be having another field season to get more tags deployed at both Wigwam Bay 
These tags are really lightweight. As you can see on the back of this black turn, it's a relatively small tag with an antenna attached to it. And the real benefit of using this technology is not only the size and weight of the tags, which are much smaller and more lightweight, which allows researchers to track small songbirds, bats, and even insects. Uh, monarch butterflies have been tagged with some of these nano tags, as we call them, and tracked during migration. But it also allows us to collect this data passively. So we don't have to recapture the bird and remove the tag in order to get the data. Um, the birds just have to fly within nine miles of these yellow dots. And that tag is emitting a unique signal that should get picked up by those towers. And then we'll know what route these birds are taking um, and what areas they're also staging at during migration. So those are those important stopover sites. And that can really help us identify important areas for their conservation along their entire life cycle. These tags also uh, have about a lifespan of four to six months, and they are usually attached in a way that allows them to fall off the bird within that time frame as well. And this is what some of those towers look like. Uh, the tall one there is on Harsons Island at St. Clair Flat State Wildlife Area, and this smaller one was installed at Lake St. Clair Metro Park just earlier this month on a really frigid morning. <laughs> and some preliminary results from our tags over the last two years. I'm excited to share this with you. We just did the analysis uh, this past winter. Um, is that four out of our 19 tag chicks were redetected off the breeding ground. So uh, two were redetected from 2019 uh, when 15 tags were deployed, and then an additional two were redetected in 2020 when only four tags were deployed um, due to COVID and high water levels was a combination of limited field work and not a great uh, success year for black terns at St. Clair Flats, unfortunately. Um, they didn't produce a lot of young last year. So we're excited uh, that we did get some detections. Low detection rates could mean a variety of things. Uh, our MODIS network around Lake St. Clair wasn't fully set up at the time that these tags were deployed. So it could be because there were gaps in the network. Um, it could just be the birds didn't fledge successfully as well. Uh, so more study is needed and we're excited to get another 30 tags deployed between the two sites this year. And again, reciting color banded individuals could really be helpful in determining their fledging success. So if you are doing any fall migration birding and you find some black terns feeding in a wetland and manage to spot a color band, uh, do let us know. And that information would be extremely helpful for this project. And I mentioned we're doing the habitat enhancement work at this site as well. So we're doing similar habitat work that we're doing in Wigwam Bay. Uh, we're cutting openings here using a different strategy. It's another mechanical way to cut back um, these cattail stands and do it in a way where the stems can be flooded and hopefully prevent them from growing back. Um, there's a chance we'll have to do additional cuts, um, but we're trying to create these openings in this particular unit. This is part of the wildlife area. It's a diked wetland, um, and this will improve the habitat for waterfowl, um, as well as secretive marsh birds and black terns. Uh, we've had black terns attempt to nest in this unit, um, which is why we're, we're focusing on this unit. Um, they feed here every May. Um, but only one pair has attempted to nest there. And with the high water levels and their decreasing success these last few years, year to year, um, we're really eager to see if some habitat enhancement can encourage them to nest within the diked wetland where it's a little more protected from high water, uh, it's more protected from boaters, and it's more protected from potential predators um, that are now getting more access to these wetlands in these bays because of high water. We have a lot more larger fish um, that are scooping up black turn chicks as soon as they hit the water. So we're really hoping we can encourage them to nest in, in this wetland unit. 
So the next steps for our black turn work statewide is to continue expanding these uh, really thorough monitoring efforts with the, the nest searching and banding of adults and young um, at these priority sites. So these are known uh, large colonies of black terns. Um, and our second step is to fill knowledge gaps of their historic breeding locations, which you can see on this map. Um, so this is a project that we did get funded that is going to launch this summer. Um, so there are a few areas near you as well. Uh, so definitely follow my birds. We'll be putting announcements out likely in April. Uh, we're still waiting to finalize all the paperwork on that, um, but we should be getting volunteer announcements out in April for all the sites in the lower peninsula. So I wanted to wrap things up a little bit by chatting about how else you can help if you're not able to participate in stewardship or community science. Uh, you can support your local conservation organizations. Uh, and your public lands in other ways. Uh, we encourage folks to buy duck stamps. Those duck stamps funds go back into acquiring wetlands and restoring wetlands across the country. Uh, you can also donate to the Adopt a Game Area program, which was launched here in Michigan just a couple years ago. Um, and this program has a list of about 20 seven, I think, state game areas. Uh, it might be growing now. Um, and you can select which game area you'd like to contribute funds to. Um, many of those double as important bird areas. Uh, oops, sorry about that. So there's, there's a way that you can contribute directly to an important bird area. Um, and then we also encourage you, again, if you can't participate in a larger community science effort, um, or, or if you're just out birding and want to contribute to science while you're, you're having some fun using eBird, um, especially if you're visiting an important bird area. Again, those are spots that we don't have dedica dedicated funding for, excuse me, um, that are really, really important for bird conservation on the whole. Um, so if you are visiting a local IBA, submitting an eBird checklist while you're there is extremely useful. Uh, those data sets were used in that 3 billion birds gone study I mentioned and Audubon's climate report. Uh, and it's a resource I know a lot of land managers refer to, including myself when planning proposals for, for grants and getting some of this on the ground work done. Um, so we really do appreciate your contributions to eBird. Uh, we also recommend that you talk to your legislators about environmental issues that are important to you and participate in public input sessions uh, held by landowners like Michigan DNR and your local county and city uh, parks and rec. If you'd like to stay in touch, uh, these are the best ways to reach out to me either via email directly or to follow the MyBirds page or visit our website. Uh, Michigan DNR also recently started this birding resource page uh, at michigan.gov forward slash birding. And I highly recommend you check that out. Uh, we'll be hopefully adding some more content there for everyone too. And with that, I just wanna thank all of you for spending the evening with me and open the floor up to questions. All right, thank you, Erin. Um... And thank you all. If you have a question, you are welcome to drop it into the chat. Um, you can put it in there and we can um, have Aaron answer your question.